There have been plenty of booms and busts over the last two years. However, few can measure up to the failed promises of those much vaunted SPACs. These blank check companies raised billions from retail investors who hoped they'd found a one way ticket to riches. Unfortunately, that ticket wasn't reserved for them, but rather for the SPAC backers. So, in my video today, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened and look at whether there is any hope for some of the most high profile of SPAC mergers. Now, before we can dive into the SPAC market, we have to have a bit of background on SPACs themselves. So, a SPAC, or Special Purpose Acquisition Company, is a publicly traded company that's created explicitly for the purpose of acquiring or merging with an already existing unlisted company. Quite simply, shell companies raise a lot of money, list their shares, and then telegraph their interests in acquiring certain private companies. This is why they're called, quote, blank check companies. The investors will buy shares in these SPACs and the sponsors of said SPAC will then decide how to spend that money. Once the SPAC has found an acquisition target and has merged with that company, the investors can either swap their shares for those of the merged company or they can request to get their original investment back, plus any accrued interest. There's also an incentive for the SPAC sponsors to find a deal. That's because not only do they get 20% of the final merged company, but if they don't complete a deal within a certain time frame, they have to give the money back to the investors. And we'll come back to this in a bit. Now, SPACs have existed for decades, but they only really picked up steam over the past few years. For example, in 2019, only 59 SPACs came to market. However, in 2020, 247 were created, and in 2021, there were an astonishing 613. Now, why were these SPACs so popular? Well, firstly, there are the investors. They held the view that a SPAC investment was one of the only ways that they would be able to get into a hot startup on the same terms as the institutional investors and VCs. No longer would they be last at the trough if the next Facebook or Coinbase were to list. They could be there right from the beginning. It also may be a preferable option for the targeted companies. That's because merging with a SPAC is generally a lot simpler than doing a listing through a traditional IPO. The latter can take up to six months, and the due diligence required on the roadshow can be grueling. Moreover, if you are going to list through a traditional IPO, then you have to accept the valuation that your book builders suggest. However, with a SPAC, there is a lot of room to negotiate with the sponsors. Then there are the benefits that accrue to those sponsors. As I mentioned, they get 20% of the stock in the merged company, which could be a massive payday if they choose to eventually close out of the position. They can essentially raise billions in other people's money on the promise that they will acquire some hot new company. They're also not encumbered by traditional securities laws that prohibit companies that are going to be IPOing from making financial projections. So, it sounds like a win-win-win, right? Well, not quite. That's because with every boom comes a bust, and this was a boom of epic proportions. The pandemic lockdowns and subsequent money printing created the ideal circumstances for SPACs to flourish. Much like the tech stock boom itself, investors flushed with stimmy checks were looking for hot new opportunities to sink their savings into. Why trade Tesla or Facebook shares when you can invest in the next Tesla or Facebook? Moreover, on the company side, there wasn't that much demand to go public through a traditional IPO markets were incredibly volatile, and companies wouldn't be able to get certainty around the value of their shares once they hit the market. So, these SPACs raised an obscene amount of money. Check out this chart over here. It shows the total funds raised by SPACs in the past three years. $13.6 billion in 2019, $83 billion in 2020, and an eye-watering $162 billion in 2021. Some of the world's most well-known capital allocators and investors 
jumped aboard the SPAC bandwagon. These include the likes of Bill Ackerman, Chamath Palahapatia, Alec Gores, Gary Cohen, and other large Wall Street private equity titans. Once these dealmakers had completed their raises, it was off to the races to find attractive targets to take public. The sponsors were also under time constraints as they only had a two-year window to complete their deals. Otherwise, they would have to return the money and lose the setup costs. Add to this mix all the companies that were looking to take advantage of the stock frenzy and get their shares to market as quickly as possible. Some of the most promising names in tech went public via a SPAC merger. So let's take a look at some of these, shall we? First up, we have Lucid Group. Now, this is a maker of electric cars that many saw as the next potential Tesla. The company went public via a SPAC in July of 2021. This was after a merger with Churchill Capital Corp 4, which gave the company a pro forma equity value of $24 billion, pretty punchy for a company that had virtually no revenue. It didn't perturb the public markets, though, as on the first day of trading, Lucid's share price was up by 9%. The deal was a big payout for many of the earlier private backers of the company, including Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, as well as BlackRock. Lucid's stock also went through a meteoric rise after the listing, and it reached its zenith in February 2021, up by nearly 500%. Another really big SPAC was that of DraftKings. The fantasy betting company went public through a SPAC merger in April 2020. This was a combined merger with Diamond Eagle Acquisition Corp and SB Tech, a betting and gaming technology company. This deal saw the company list with a market cap of over $3 billion. Then, to illustrate just how much easier a SPAC listing is than a traditional IPO, there was the WeWork listing in October 2021. If you'll recall, WeWork had planned to go public in a traditional IPO back in 2019. However, that failed to materialize given the intense scrutiny that was placed on the company once its IPO filings were made public. Many also questioned the valuation at the time. So WeWork paused its IPO plans only to eventually come back to the market and list its shares at a $9 billion valuation. If only Adam Newman attempted that the first time. And I'm sure that many of you must have heard of SoFi. SoFi Technologies Inc. is a student loan operator that went public in June 2021 through a SPAC sponsored by Chamath Palahapatia, the, quote, SPAC king himself. Given how well-known Chamath is in the space, his SPAC deals usually come at a premium, and SoFi was no exception. The deal valued the company at $8.6 billion, and when the shares debuted on the Nasdaq stock exchange, they rallied by over 12%. Chamath was also involved in a number of other high-profile SPACs. One of his earlier ones was Virgin Galactic SPAC merger back in 2019. Chamath's social capital Hedo Sophia took a 49% stake in the company, with those shares eventually listing. As one of the first commercial space companies to list on the public markets, there was a great deal of excitement in the stock as it climbed to almost six times the listing price, reaching its all-time high in February 2021. Chamath wasn't alone in his SPAC stardom, however. For example, there was Alec Gores, the private equity titan who in early 2021 completed what was then the largest SPAC deal so far. That was the merger with United Wholesale Mortgage in a deal which valued the company at $16 billion. The frenzy didn't stop there, of course. That's because in May 2021, Grab Holdings Incorporated thoroughly trounced that record. Now, if the name is unfamiliar, You can think of Grab as Southeast Asia's equivalent of Uber. The deal with the Altimeter Growth Corp SPAC valued Grab at a gargantuan $40 billion. Now, these SPAC deals mentioned were only just a few of the hundreds that happened over the past two years. I'll leave a link to this website for you, which lists many of the other deals that were completed. So, it's all pretty clear that it was SPAC season. However, Seasons change, and as the Fed giveth, well, the Fed taketh away. As the consequences of the wave of money printing became obvious, 
global central bankers began to reverse their monetary stimulus. In March of last year, the Fed started to pump interest rates, and they continued their quest until December, when they took the Fed's fund rate to 4.5%. From zero to 4.5% in under nine months. It's pretty mind-blowing when you think about it. As was expected, this sucked liquidity out of most financial markets. Equities, crypto, credit, all risk assets, really. This, of course, included all those hot new stock listings, especially those that went public via a SPAC. So let's take a look at how some of those SPAC mergers that I talked about earlier performed over the past two years. Lucid Group is down 35%. DraftKings is down 75%. Virgin Galactic down by 84%. And SoFi by 78%. The bad news doesn't stop there, however. The likes of WeWork, United Wholesale Mortgage, and Grab Holdings are now even below their list prices. For Grab, it's been down only ever since that first day. It currently has a market capitalization of $12.2 billion, a far cry from its lofty $40 billion valuation on listing. Now, while part of this can be blamed on the broader macro environment, factors specific to the SPAC companies have had an outsize impact on their negative performance. For example, there is actually an ETF that tracks the performance of a wide array of SPAC companies. It's called the AXS DSPAC ETF, and it holds a total of 26 of these companies. Between January 2021 and December 2020, this ETF is down by 80%. By comparison, The S&P 500 is down by only 0.2%, and the Nasdaq is down by 20%. It's not only the performance of SPACs that have gone public that makes for uncomfortable reading, however, but the valuations that newer ones are now fetching when they go public. You can see what that looks like over here with the average listing valuation, considerably down from the 2021 heyday. So, This begs an important question. Is the SPAC model flawed? Well, one of the problems with the SPAC model is that the sponsor's incentives are often not well aligned with those of long-term investors. The sponsors get paid in stock once the mergers are completed, and many consider 20% to be an exorbitant amount to reward them for the limited risk they take. The sponsors also have the right to sell these shares once they're listed. Moreover, these are time-limited structures where the sponsor has to find a deal inside two years. Otherwise, they have to return the funds. If they do that, then they incur the initial setup costs at a loss, which usually runs into the millions. Therefore, there is pressure for the sponsors to find the deal. Now, this reminds me of what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger said about these deals at a Berkshire Hathaway meeting in 2021 have to spend their money in two years, as I understand it. So they have to buy a business in two years. If you put a gun to my head and said, you got to buy a big business in two years, you know, I'd buy one. But (laughs) in that same clip, which I've linked to below, Munger goes on to call it, quote, fee driven buying, i.e. the sponsors and their bankers only get paid if they complete a deal, no matter how bad. And in many cases, the fees that are paid to the sponsors advisors are more than would be paid for a traditional IPO. Once the advisors have banked their fees and the sponsors have cashed out their equity, the retail investors could be left holding the bag if the stock doesn't perform. Quite simply, the backers and bankers have all the upside and very little of the downside. Then you have the fact that a SPAC merger requires less due diligence and rigmarole than a traditional IPO. It's fast-paced private equity and venture capital deal-making done for deals which traditionally require many, many steps. While some may view these filings and processes as unnecessary, they are time-tested and are there for a reason. They are part of the reason why the initial WeWork IPO didn't pass muster. Quite simply, the due diligence that's required for taking a company public and offering its shares to retail investors should be different for those who do deals in risky startups. I mean, surely it must be a massive loophole if in a traditional IPO model, 
the company is restricted from making forward-looking statements, whereas with a SPAC, it's open season. There were numerous examples of the sponsors touting the future potential and price action of these SPAC mergers to retail investors. If any project were to do this in the crypto space, for example, they would have the SEC breathing down their neck. Yet, because this involves stocks and rich institutional stroke high net worth backers, it's again open season. So, while the SPAC model was an interesting way for retail investors to get dibs on some of those hot stocks, they've often proved to be a poison chalice. What was thought to be a structure that would allow retail to get in on the same terms as institutions turned out to be quite the opposite. So, what does this mean for the much vaunted SPAC merger going forward? Well, the forecasts are cloudy with a chance of thunderstorms. For one, there are all those high profile SPAC liquidations that have happened over the past two months. Now, a liquidation is when the SPAC sponsor eventually decides they can't find the right target and they elect to wind up the SPAC and return funds to investors. In December last year, at least 70 SPACs were wound up. So, in one month, we saw more SPAC liquidations than we previously seen in the entire history of the market. You can see exactly what that looks like in this chart over here, quarterly losses to the sponsors of liquidations. Some of the most high-profile SPAC backers and sponsors have also been closing up their companies. For example, in September last year, Chamath Palahapatya decided to close two of his remaining SPACs and return roughly $2.4 billion to investors. One of the other SPAC kings, Alec Gores, said that he would be closing three of his SPACs and returning $1.3 billion to investors. Then you have the biggest SPAC of all, the $4 billion Pershing Square Tontine SPAC backed by billionaire Bill Ackman. Ackman acknowledged that, quote, high quality and profitable, durable growth companies can generally postpone their timing to go public until market conditions are more favorable, which limited the universe of high quality possible deals for Pershing Square Tontine. Now, if you read between the lines, he's basically admitting that quality companies don't really need to merge with a SPAC and that it was hard to find any in the current market environment. Well, credit to him for at least acknowledging this and returning those funds. Now, there are a number of other considerations playing on the minds of sponsors, and they include increased regulatory oversight as well as tax changes. When it comes to the former, the SEC has proposed new rules to enhance disclosures and investor protections. This would cover aspects such as conflicts of interest of the sponsors, as well as potential dilution for the investors. In the words of Gary Gensler, quote, Functionally, the SPAC target IPO is being used as an alternative means to conduct an IPO. Thus, investors deserve the protections they receive from traditional IPOs with respect to information asymmetries, fraud and conflicts, and, when it comes to disclosure, marketing practices, gatekeepers and issuers. As it relates to potential tax changes, a 1% federal tax on share repurchases that is part of the new Inflation Reduction Act could hit SPAC sponsors. That's because if the sponsors were to return the funds to the investors, then this could be considered a repurchase. Hence, they could be on the hook for 1% of all the funds returned to investors. It's no wonder that these issuers are rushing to liquidate their SPACs. It's also worth reminding you that there are many SPACs that remain outstanding. By some estimates, there could be as many as 400, which still have about $100 billion in their coffers. They are struggling to find attractive deals. There are also an additional 150 SPACs with about $25 billion outstanding that have reached merger agreements but have not closed them. These include some high-profile deals like Truth Social's SPAC merger. However, it's likely that many of these could get called off. You only need to look at the example of Circle Financial's much-vaunted public listing, which was called off as recently as a month ago, the $9 billion deal that never happened. So, quite simply, SPAC listing season is over and liquidations could become the new norm.
One has to wonder whether SPACs will ever emerge again in their current form. OK, time for a few closing thoughts on SPACs. The past three years have been a whirlwind in financial markets perhaps more than anywhere else. SPACs flourished at a time when the average retail investor was flush with cash and was wide-eyed at the possibility of making it big in the stock market. This helped to supercharge the SPAC boom, a boom that was ridden to astronomical highs by the wealthy sponsors who backed these SPACs. And it's not as though SPACs were irredeemable money grabs. They did give retail investors a chance at a hot new ticket. They did provide companies with a shot at an eventual public listing. Some of those stocks that listed via SPAC rode to incredible highs, and those that cashed out did make bank. However, with every boom comes a bust. And it's in those busts that we learn about the fundamental flaws. As Warren Buffett likes to say, it's when the tide goes out that you can see who has been swimming naked. In the case of SPACs, the often misaligned incentives between the sponsors and the investors warped valuations. The two-year timeline pressured them to make a deal with the downside considerations and afterthought. Moreover, the shortcuts taken over the traditional IPO model led to a situation in which companies that weren't ready listed anyway. It's also meant that retail investors didn't have the same protections that they usually have with the traditional IPO model. So, with this backdrop, it's no coincidence that we're facing a frenzy of liquidations, something that's only likely to accelerate this year. For those companies that listed via a SPAC merger, their shares may still struggle. Their valuations on listing were highly inflated, and the macro backdrop means that stocks could still suffer in the coming year. It will also mean less profits for the sponsors and their rainmaker backers. However, given how much they made during the SPAC boom, I don't think they'll be hurting that much. But hey, that is Wall Street for you. And that's it for my video today, folks, but I'm keen to get some of your feedback. Did any of you invest in stocks listed via a SPAC? What do you think? Could they recover? Let me know in the comments below. And while you're down there, you may also want to check out my deals page. It's over here that I have some of the best promos and discounts in the crypto space exclusively for the viewers of this channel. And finally, give me a like and subscribe on the way out. Both are always greatly appreciated. Well, guys, that about does it. Catch you later on down the trail. Thank <laughs> you.